Okay, that was MFQ starting off with Rodney on the Rock's traditional theme, This Could Be the Night, a rare Spectre track. And that goes out to the film crew from London who are in L.A. right now. They're doing a film on Phil Spectre, and they're trying to track Phil down. I hope they find him. It won't be easy, but I'll keep you informed on their progress. Anyway, this goes out for them. And it would have sounded like I met her on a Monday And my heart stood still The do run, run, run The do run, run And somebody, somebody told me Her name was Jill The do run, run, run The do run, run Probably means the same thing as do I diddy and all those other silly things. Actually, there was a big discussion about whether it should be met her on a Monday and my heart stood still or met him on a Sunday and my heart stood still. Um, Sunday seems like the day to meet someone and fall in love. But Monday sounds better. Met him on a Monday instead of met him on a Sunday. Like, where that S come from? So met him on a Monday is where it is and everyone thinks it's Sunday. But it's Monday. It's the only good thing that's ever happened on a Monday. And you're listening to Rodney on the Rock, and this is the Phil Spector Show. Some of you might say, who's Phil Spector? Well, he's a, a little guy that, he's like a teenage millionaire back in the 50s that produced everybody. You name the band, he produced, he produced the Stones, he's produced the Beatles. Of course, all the early stuff with the girl groups like the Ronettes, Crystals, and Darlene Love, and all that in the 60s. You probably see him in movies even. He was in the opening scene of Easy Rider when uh, he was the cocaine dealer in, in Easy Rider, and he's been on uh, uh, I Dream a Genie, and he's done, he's done everything. Then you heard his group, the Teddy Bears, doing To Know Him Is To Love Him. He uh, formed that group in 1958. Now we're going into the 60s. 
Here's a big hit that Phil had with um, Benny King. There is a rose in Spanish Hollow. If Phil ever served an apprenticeship with anyone, it was with Lieber and Stoller, and it was with Jerry Lieber that he wrote Spanish Harlem when Phil was in his teens. Uh, Lester Sill, who was responsible, an old and dear friend of ours, was responsible for getting us into the music industry, um, took us around, introduced us to all of the um, independent record company owners, uh, like the people who owned Aladdin Records and Modern Records and Specialty Records. These were all the little record companies that were cooking around the early 50s. Uh, Phil Spector was discovered 10 years later by Lester Sill. And um, Lester gave us a call. We were in New York at the time. And said he had a very talented young man who was rather frustrated with the music scene on the West Coast and really wanted to get with Lieber and Stoller and see what was happening. He, was, he wanted to appre apprentice himself uh, to Lieber and Stoller. And would we consider taking him over? Uh, he seemed a, a very bright, a very sharp young man, uh, uh, very witty, um, sarcastic. I, I sensed um, a rather angry young man, um, and, and he dressed uh, like a businessman. He, he wore a tie, a suit and a tie, and uh, looked like he was uh, a young man on the, on the make. What finally happened was we were called to do Ray Peterson for Big Top Records, and we were really uh, uh, absolutely under uh, with uh, commitments. We were behind, and I thought that would be a great opportunity for Phil to get his feet wet uh, in producing a record on his own. So we convinced the powers that be, at, the powers that were at Big Top to try <laughs> Phil Spector out. And uh, he had a big hit right out of the, the first session, it was Corrine Corina. Uh, and that was his first independent production under the aegis of Lieber and Stoller as an apprentice. After that, Atlantic became very much interested in Phil Spector. The truth is that after many, many sessions and spending uh, quite a bit of money, he didn't pull any hits out of uh, his hat at Atlantic, and they became very disenchanted. And uh, Phil went on. I'm not sure what the next move was. But uh, well, I think the next important move was that he started a record company with Lester Sill called F Phil Less Records. Uh, as soon as the label became successful, which it did and became extremely successful, I mean, that was the main string of Phil's hits, uh, he attempted to uh, take over the entire label by himself and, and get rid of Lester Sill. Uh, and uh, which he was ultimately successful in doing. This spacious mansion is built on one man's capacity for long-range survival in the unpredictable record business. 25 years old, he owns record and publishing companies valued in the millions. He began to compose, arrange, and sing at the age of 16. Dozens of hit records since then indicate that Spectre's beat is closely tuned to Teen Desire. I myself have a tremendous yearning. A yearning to be respected, a yearning to be accepted. I see this in the teenagers, yearning to do things, to be someone, to be important, and to be recognized. I go to say exactly why anyone would respond to this music. But basically, it is an emotional music for an emotional generation. Phil Spector decided to release his records on his own label. The label was Philly's Records. The LES was Lester Sill. His talent number one, best of any producer I've ever met. More imagination. He's a great songwriter. He's a great arranger. Great engineer, great producer. He knows exactly what he wants. And he doesn't stop until he gets it. Never compromises. Never. Never did. <laughs>
he's a rebel, and you're listening to Rodney and Phil Spector. Think of a real pioneer of the rock and roll business, and you'll think of the president of Atlantic Records. And I wonder what he has to say about Phil. There aren't uh, that many uh, producers today who are producers in the sense that Phil was a producer. Phil was really the man who, a man who made the record. Uh, the artist was secondary. He needed an artist who could carry on, carry on and, 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 and come out and make this, sing the song. But uh, it, the artist could be interchangeable. Uh, uh, what was important was his concept, the song, and his concept of, of the production. Two people who really worked closely with Phil when he was making historic, his historic records uh, at different times were Sonny Bono and Nino Tempo, who became sort of disciples of his. And uh, I would suggest that uh, you talk to Nino Tempo, who's a great friend of, of Sonny's and who's producing records today and has produced some great records on his own. Phil Spector is a very unusual human being. Uh, certainly not your everyday run-of-the-mill issue record producer. He, uh, extremely brilliant, extremely sensitive. The best ears in a recording stu studio that I've ever come across. He would hear things that only a dog could hear. He'd point something out many times. He'd have to actually point it out for me to hear it. I, I just... Once he, I focused on it, then I, I, I got it. But he had incredible ears. Uh, he, he was very egotistical. And I don't say that in a, in a negative manner because I don't believe that he could have made the kind of records he made if he didn't have quite an ego. I think they go hand in hand. from Phil yet, well I guess it'll take time, but they're off to Studio A at Gold Star here in Hollywood. Stan Ross, Larry Levine will be there to tell them all about the Wall of Sound. The Wall of Sound was a descriptive name given by uh, someone else other than Phil. I mean, he didn't coin the phrase Wall of Sound. Uh, 
he that wall of sound actually came through because at the at that point in time and we're talking about 1961 now just prior to that or at that time the most popular records were being made the hits were being made uh, with a group of four and five musicians and so now Phil came in and he brought in a new rhythm section uh, uh, which included three guitars two basses two or three pianos uh, horns. Well, at that point there was still only one, but uh, actually there were a lot of percussion because anyone that came in to visit the session got put on uh, playing something, percussion usually. So we had all of those people and now the records weren't being made like that, you see. So uh, there was this wall of sound. Uh, the wall of sound is a function of this studio. There's no doubt about it. The Studio A at Gold Star. The basic wall of sound was the echo chambers. And it was because of a over booking the room with too many musicians. It, it sounded very small. It's very, very closed in. And we have acoustic chambers here. And uh, Larry opened up the chambers and started to put each and every other musician, I think. The echo chambers never uh made the sound acceptable they enhanced the sound but the fact that the room was filled with musicians and it is a small room uh bounced everything bounced off of and we we got all of this meshing going on you know and then you added the chambers to it and so you got this sound that all became this wall it was a, a room saturation we had it all melded together in the room and of course, there was one other ingredient that helped make it the wall of sound. A minor ingredient, but still meaningful. And that's Phil Spector. Okay, you're listening to Rodney on the Rock. We're still going here. All Grown Up. That was the last release on Philly's record in Before Phil Spector, there was another record producer, both independent and successful, a man who put Little Richard and Sam Cooke into rock and roll history and paved the way for their imitators. Let's see what a great record producer has to say about another. Well, I think that he, as a producer, did his job. And he did his job well, and he was, uh, uh, got over. Uh, what I think of him as a producer in the lights of but I personally, which is my own personal opinion of producers, I didn't uh, give him the esteem uh, that the press and the media gave him. His work was always uh, cliched, and he stole, and I say that with capital S-T-O-L-E, from black musicians, singers, writers, and producers, even myself. <laughs> It happens i had darlene on my show last year she's an amazing singer and i'm sure she'll have some things to say at the interview i met phil while i was the background singer i met him through a gentleman named lester sill 
Um, I was doing work for Lester Sill at the time, and Phil was in town from New York City looking for someone to record He's a Rebel. With me, Phil was a very easygoing person. Um, I didn't have all the trouble and the problems everybody else had. When I went into the re recording studio to sing or to perform, that's what I was there for. And I never really had any problems with Philip. You know, he would tell me the way he wanted me to sing it, and I would do it. Uh, if he had a problem, the uh, words or whatever uh, weren't coming out right, or he couldn't understand them, he would stop me and tell me. But we would usually go into the studio, and within one to five takes, I was finished. Every evening when the sun goes down, <laughs> Darling? Let's forget about the interest now. Let's just come right in. One, two, three. Every evening when the sun goes down, I lay my head on the pillow down. Every evening when the sun goes down, I lay my head on the Me and business. <laughs> now that's a different story because see like when I got with Phil, like when I did He's a Rebel, it was already understood I was getting paid $1,500 to do the record, which was fine. When the record was such a big success, we signed contracts. Uh, in those days, a contract was only as good as how powerful you were. I'll put it that way. Uh, if you had the money to get out of contracts, you could get out of them. In those days, Nobody was running around trying to get out of contract if something bad happened or you weren't getting along with the producer or you weren't getting paid. So between 1963 and 65, I was signed to Philip. Uh, I got a total, I got one royalty statement from Philip for $3,000. And that was it. I never got another dime from Phil. That's when we started not really getting along. And um, back in those days, like 20 years ago, it didn't bother me as much then because I was young and experienced and never thought at the time that I was being used or whatnot by Philip. It wasn't until years later that I started feeling like that I was really being used by Phil because the records were still being produced and still being put out under my name, under the Crystal's names, under Bobby Sox and the Blue Jeans name, and nobody was getting paid. And I was just feeling that I was really being exploited now at this time. Here it is 20 years later, and I'm still not getting any money from Philip. And I think enough is enough. Moving right along to the Phil Spector show. Well, here's Cher. Pizzas to promotion to production, the other half of share. What's Sonny Bono going to tell them about Phil Spector? I was a promotion man. I went and got the records played, and I worked at the distributorship that uh, that handled his product. And um, it's always nice for a promotion man when you can walk into a radio station, give them a record, and they're just dying to play it. Usually, it's the opposite. You know, you have to take them to dinner. Uh, uh, give them money, choke them, anything to get a record played, but they were always happy to get, get a Phil Spector record because they always knew it would be a hit. So it was such a treat to do that, and I was just absolutely mesmerized by his, his records. So he used to come from New York once in a while, have meetings on the product, and um, when he did, uh, I just was determined that I was going to go to work for him. So I just told him, I said, Philip, I, I want to work for you, just you. And um, I told him I'd work for any, any, any amount of money for any amount of time. And so he was happy with that, and he worked me for no money and a lot of time. I, I think his downfall was that 
he duplicated himself, his sound all the time. And I think when, when Philip and I broke communication, when I was his promotion man, I said, Phil, I think we've got to change the sound because after a certain period of time, it didn't get the same reaction that it did for a couple years, you know. And then we kept duplicating this one single sound. After a while, nobody had the enthusiasm that they originally had, you know. And as the enthusiasm dropped, then it became a problem getting those records played. That was something he just didn't want to confront, you know, having to go with a, uh, a different sound. And frankly, I don't know if he can, you know. Basically, everything he's ever done is beautiful, but it's basically all that, that big wall of sound. <laughs> Please, Phil Spector, make me a star. Help me get up where the righteous brothers are. Get Let's see what the goddaughter of Phil Spector has to say about her goddad. She's the daughter of Lenny Bruce. And Phil, if you're listening, give these guys a break, huh? Mr. Spector, I get down on my knees to you. For everybody that's, that's watching that, what I want you to know about Phil Spector is that, number one, that he's a good father. He's a real good dad. And he takes care of his children, and, he's, and they have dinner together, and he's a good man. He's a good person. He paid for my father's funeral. He, um, he loves to decorate. He takes care of his house. His house is, um, everything is in... in and velvets, and it's very important to him how things are decorated because it looks like a mausoleum, that house.
Phil Spector's music is uh, yesterday's hits today. This is Holly Natalian's Holly Vincent doing a Chapel of Love. It's written by um, Jeff Berry, Ellie Greenidge, and Phil Spector. Have a heavy metal twist. Here's Legs Diamond doing the Righteous Brothers hit. We lost that love and feeling. Now there's no welcome look in your eyes when I reach for you. And so you're starting to. Patty Smith. From a concert in 1978. Of course, a bit of salute to Phil Spector. Oh, and the California sound of the Beach Boys. Of course, Brian Wilson is noted for borrowing the Spectre sound. This is the Beach Boys doing and then I kissed her also. And even myself recorded a Phil Spectre song. Then I kissed her, produced by Dan Phillips and David Scott, who are uh, Barney Kessel's sons. Not only is this next one a cover tune, but this one was actually produced by Phil Spector at the Gold Star Studios. Of course, Dan Ross and Larry Levine were on hand for the Ramones doing Baby I Love You. Phil's music is still going on and on today. It will never die. John Cassidy has done it, Mick Jagger. There's even more bands out there today doing even more tunes. Phil Spector, where are you? You know, this next thing is just like so rare, I can't even begin to tell you how rare it is. It just never came out. It's, uh, it's actually the first session that Dan Phillips and David Scott actually got to play on that Phil produced. John Lennon, because Phil did a lot of John Lennon's big hits, like Imagine and um, Insta Karma, all those Phil did. Anyway, Phil did a rock and roll album with John Lennon, and here's a song that's not on that rock and roll album, and it's John Lennon doing Be My Baby, produced by Phil Spector. cuts on that John Lennon rock and roll album that he did, which were phenomenal. And uh, that was the first thing we did with Bill, actually, with the John Lennon stuff. Yeah. But uh, even though he said, come down, we're going to do some stuff with Sherrod, it ended up being John and all that kind of stuff. And from there, we did a bunch of sessions with him and uh, really got into, like, really deeply production, which we really hadn't considered at that time, which was a whole new game. And to see it done that way was just different. The John Lennon sessions were pretty amazing, as you might expect. Like, John was really uh, in a seriously aggressive mood in those days, and um, Phil was very, always has been very aggressive. And uh, a lot of great musicians, a lot of good music. I guess that's kind of a starter. Yes, David and I played uh, electric guitar, rhythm guitar in those sessions, and uh, probably 
some of the greatest sessions that we've been involved with. Um, the, the artistic tension was really present there between John and Phil. They worked well together and, there, and the chemistry was there, but there was also, uh, like I say, a tension between the two of them. I think it was an artistic tension of one wanting to go one way and one wanting to go the other way, and you usually have that with any artist-producer relationship, but with those two people, it just got very intense. It started out with John asking Phil, or, or telling Phil, like, I just want to be like Ronnie Spector, like, go for it. One of the main things I'd have to say about Phil, like uh, modern day wise, is that um, he's very active. He's uh, in the studio a lot when people don't know he's in the studio. And he really doesn't feel pressured or obligated to make a record just to be like currently on the charts right this second. I don't think that really relates to Phil Spector. Phil Spector is an artist and he can make a record whenever he chooses to. It's just like saying uh, Picasso didn't do a painting this week, so therefore. He's um, passed and, and has been, which, which is really wrong. I know uh, a lot of people like discount Phil after the Phyllis era, but when you consider all the hits he's had with the Beatles, various members of the Beatles, singular, like Grammys, George Harrison, John Lennon, etc. When you consider the Ramones he did, which is their biggest selling LP they've ever had. When you consider that Yoko Ono asked him to please come and help finish her solo album after John died, that's pretty current, and that's pretty uh, pretty selective as to the type of work he wishes to do. I'll tell you a story about the Ramones. We were in the studio with them at Gold Star, doing uh, some recordings with them, and we were uh, on our way over to Phil's with all four of them. Uh, Joey was a game for it. The other three, uh, they, they started to get weird, and they said, oh, no, 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 you can go, Joey. We're not going to go. We're not going to get stuck up there all alone up there in that house. Because they'd been up there before, and they, they kind of felt that they got, got trapped up there. So actually, I think they were uh, lucky to be up there, because uh, when we got up there, okay, we, the other three bailed out at the Tropicana, which is where a lot of the fans stay. And we went up to the house with uh, Joey. And uh, I remember Joey was saying, gee, Phil, I really want you to produce us, because we need a big main producer for our new album, because Seymour said we need a big main producer, and it'll help us sell. And I think a point about a producer versus Phil Spector is Phil said, well, if you need a big name producer, go find one. If you want Phil Spector to produce you, then I'll consider it. If you really want to know more about the Ramones and Phil Spector in those sessions, uh, perhaps you ought to ask the Ramones. Well, uh, working with Phil is very difficult because uh, I guess he's a perfectionist, so he likes to spend a lot of time redoing things and re-listening and... It's very time consuming. It comes very hard for a, I mean, rock and roll's gotta be spontaneous and done a little faster. I like um, beauty to be instant, you know, and not to be labored over, and I don't like music to be a hustle. You know, I think we can adequately go into the studio and, and do it and not just be frustrated. And Phil seemed to be frustrated with us. I think he's frustrated with himself, really. He wasn't um, the most friendly guy I've ever met. He tried to be friends, but then he would had a gun on him, and he may, wouldn't let me out of his house for a couple of days. And you know, he wouldn't let. And then if he said, if you want to play his pinball machine, he'd let you play it for a minute, and then he'd say, okay, everybody to another room. And I never met anyone like him, and I hope I, you know. Now he's just too difficult to work with, and it's too costly and time-consuming, and uh, in the 1980s. You know, you can't spend, I mean, uh, the opening chord to a song of Rock and Roll High School, he spent 12 hours sitting there listening to the same chord over and over again. I mean, it's just not worth it. That nobody, nobody else could hear the difference. But the chord came out sounding okay, but 12 hours worth ain't really worth it, you know? You just go crazy. You, you would be as crazy as him if uh, we worked in a, with, with him again.
Times have changed, and um, most producers from the mid-60s haven't really grown with the changes. They're not, they're not able to do what producers now can do. It's a new modern sound, and he doesn't have it. No. His, his time's passed. <laughs> but we wanted to work with Phil because, uh, I mean, the guy is a legend, and we... Uh, so it'd be a very good idea to work with a legend and uh you never know when it is be his last project and uh plus we didn't really know how difficult it is to work with the guy before we we stepped into it we found out you know like when when before i wanted to work with him a hundred percent and uh I, w I was going home for the project but he came off differently he seemed more positive and more able and when I got into the studio I found him to be like a helpless little boy or something like a very helpless person he didn't know what to do and that just stifles creativity when you just hang around in agony and frustration and, and stomp your foot and say oh what are we gonna do and all you know that doesn't bring out anything in anybody I guess faced with the project he was very enthused and then when she gets to the that all of a sudden now it's the time, I guess then he must get a bit nervous about that all of a sudden it's getting near the time where he has to put out a project which is going to be criticized. He seemed like so a then, man. You know, then it becomes very hard, it gets harder, for, harder and harder for him to finish the project for the time of pre-production. He seemed like a man walking his last mile doing our record, you know, that grim. Hi, this is Ronnie Spector and you're listening to Rodney on the Rock on KROQ FM. as Ronnie Bennett with her sister and her cousin. Phil Spector called them the Ronettes. He uh, wanted somebody to sing back up, uh, singing from New York. And um, we jumped to the chance. And uh, we called him. And we said uh, we sing back up and stuff. So we met him a couple of days later at the place called Mirror Sound on 57th Street here in New York. And uh, first meeting was just him and us, the three of us. He was sitting at a piano. And uh, he just said, sing what you usually sing. And so we started singing a little three-part harmony stuff. He said, well, do you know anything like, uh, you know, like any of the, you know, like rock and roll songs? And I said, well, I know Frankie Lyman stuff by heart. You know, and all that stuff, the lamp. And he said, well, let me hear it. And I started saying, why do birds sing so gay? He said, that's the voice. Well, I think Phil was uh, a very normal person at the very beginning of his career. Just very dedicated and very determined. But as time went on, um, they started writing about him being a genius. And then um, he said, yeah, I am a genius. This is the thoughts that I was, I was living with him, that I was thinking, as he, because I, I was watching him. And then um, they would say he's the mad genius, so he became the mad genius. I mean, with anything they wrote about him, uh, he's a recluse, so he became a recluse. I mean, this is my opinion. I think if Phil hadn't read anything about himself, I think he would still be the same. But uh, th that sort of destroyed him because he became a replicate of everything he read about himself. I wouldn't say he's mad. I, I, a lot of times I think he's pretending to be because I've seen him straight, go, like we're going someplace, and then I've seen him act it, that weird way of his. So a lot of it is intentional. A lot of it may be mad, but a lot of it is certainly intentional. 
to let people wonder about what what is this guy all about. I think he's always wanted attention. And I think he's also always wanted to be an artist on his own. He just didn't have the, the talent or the voice. Because after all, he started out with a teddy bear, so it shows you right there, he wanted to be a performer himself. But he couldn't, because he didn't have the talent for that. But he had the talent for producing and writing, so he did that. I think he's not working now, but partly because of his, of his pride. And he's afraid, because he doesn't, if he thinks, if it's not gonna be a hit, you know, he's just like, he's afraid. Because he did a, a few things with the Ramones and, and Cher, and they weren't successful. So I think he's afraid, like the name that he has, he wants to maintain as being that genius and that mad genius. And I think he's actually afraid to go back in the studio. They're afraid that it may not become a hit. And uh, people would st start saying he's not such a genius, and he wants to keep that title. Well, Phil Spector is really the, uh, the voice of a whole era of American popular music. This was the era that uh, followed upon the first advent of rock and roll in the early 60s. After the uh, rockabillies and the hard rockers and the little Richard types and so forth had sort of been wiped out by a big uh, wave of uh, disapprobation, a moral panic, you could call it symbolized by the payola scandal, the slate was sort of wiped clean and rock had to resume on a different basis. There was this great hole, this, this declivity, and Phil Spector filled that space. The space between Elvis and the Beatles was Phil Spector's. Well, of course, Phil is famous for a thing he called the wall of sound. And um, recently I went back and I reviewed Spectre's records, which are now available in a big compendious collection. And I was astounded, I was shocked at how horrible these records really are. They're a monument to what we call in America schlock. You know, it, it's, it's musical garbage on such an abundant scale that you're sort of awestruck by it. Rock and roll is basically institutionalized adolescence. And the bottom line of rock and roll is that it's a baby food industry. And Phil found a new formula for baby food. Uh, Phil made a record that he wrote by himself called When I Saw You, which was written for me. And uh, it was the only song that he wrote with no other co-writers. And it was obviously he had written it just for me. And it went something like, when I saw you, that's when I knew I'd lose my mind over you. And uh, it, uh, it kind of happened to him. Not meaning losing his mind over me, but just losing his mind.
Well, Phil never showed up for the film crew. I guess he's got other things in his head. But we got some Spectre stuff to do here. Here's something unusual. This is a song that Phil did with the Crystals called Do the Screw in order to kill a contract or something with Phil Spectre's lawyer yelling out Do the Screw. And here it is. Let's dance the screw, part one. Let's do it. Thank you. 